I came across a free PDF for Fade In, The Making of Star Trek Insurrection, a textbook on screenwriting from within the Star Trek universe by the late Michael Piller, the screenwriter for Star Trek Insurrection. It's an interesting book that provides insights on how this movie got made and gives gems of storytelling advice, not just from Piller, but from some of his writing heroes. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but I don't agree with everything Piller says, especially when you look at the movie. But this book reminds us Hollywood is a soulless machine that chews up and spits out ideas until little more than a product designed to make money and appeal to the largest demographic is left. And making a movie is not a quick and easy endeavor. Sometimes you think all the ideas and character beats are there from the beginning, and any plot snafus they run into, were they blind? Why couldn't they see that? Probably the people passionate about the movie were given mandates from on high, or told this is your budget, make it work, so they had to cut scenes. Or you've got a superstar actor who wants his character to be a sexy action hero when that doesn't make sense for his character. There are a thousand things that can go wrong in the making of a movie, so even if I don't like Star Trek Insurrection, I don't hate it like I did before reading this book. This opened my eyes to a lot of bad movies that probably didn't mean to be bad and had someone who believed in what they were doing but were probably being pulled in different directions in order to make what they made. Much as I'd rather have stayed blind to the awful truth, I guess I should thank this book for opening my eyes to reality. Having said that, one of the problems with Star Trek Insurrection is it doesn't feel as epic as the previous two movies at least tried to be. A team up between Kirk and Picard? Sign me up! A big budget war with the Borg? Sign me up. Picard coming onto a woman over three times his age? I, uh, no. Apparently this was by design. Pillar and producer Rick Berman wanted something along the lines of Star Trek IV to Voyage Home. No wonder I hate it. The Enterprise discovers a plan by the Federation and the Sona to relocate the Baku from their home world because their world has radiation that can give eternal life. There's a lot of plot stuff that doesn't make any sense. I'd go into greater detail, but Red Letter Media already went into that in a much more entertaining fashion than I could. So here are questions still nagging at my brain. Instead of spending three minutes on questions with no answers, you're here to see me try to fix this piece. So, <sighs> I'm not the first person to say this should have been part of the Dominion War. Others have pointed out the dangers in that. The Enterprise plays an integral part in the war that diminishes what should be the main story for Deep Space Nine. Likewise, when I was a kid, I had no idea what Deep Space Nine was. For me, Star Trek was TNG. So if you have characters from that show cameo, that would take someone unfamiliar with DS9 out of the narrative, or at least it would have for me. Pillar wanted to include the Dominion War, but writing a screen play for a movie takes a while, so he had to ask Ira Stephen Baird, DS9 showrunner, to essentially look a year and a half in the future and predict where the Dominion War would be. Baird suspected it would be winding down, and that, combined with producer Rick Berman's lack of love for the Dominion War, pushed Pillar in a different direction. I think using the Dominion War is a good idea, just tricksy. A war that's been plaguing the Federation for a few years feels much grander in scale than what the movie did. What about Rick Berman? To hear Pillar describe Berman, he's not unreasonable. He might argue against a line or a scene, but if Pillar could argue in favor of it, he would be okay with it, though he might come back and attack that same thing the next day. While Pillar says Berman didn't like the Dominion War, that's not the same as Pillar saying you can't do it. If Pillar pushed for it and argued well, I think they could have. And while Berman is the one who compared what they were aiming for with Star Trek 4, and Pillar was on board with that, if Berman was as reasonable as Pillar paints him, I think a writer, the hypothetical me, could have convinced Berman to go in this direction. This means we don't get two movies in a row where Picard disobeys direct orders and doesn't face the music. I don't want to come down too hard, they cannibalized two scripts to please everyone, and Picard being a rogue came from Patrick Stewart, so repetition from First Contact was probably far from their thoughts. I'd downplay Data's importance here. I like Data okay, but in all the TNG movies, he's the second most important character. Pillar acts like it was a given Data would have a large role, and I don't get it. Pillar's creative process seemed to be please Berman and various other higher-ups, then to please Patrick Stewart, and following that, Brent Spiner. Spiner wasn't a producer, so you don't need to make him happy, at least not over any other cast members. What's puzzling about this is how Pillar mentions when he first came on board TNG as a writer, Data seemed to have been developed more than anyone else besides Picard, so he tried to focus on other characters. Not sure why he forgot that by the time he wrote this movie. TNG was an ensemble series. There's a bunch of characters you could focus on. I featured Data pretty heavily in my first contact video, so we won't have the kid from Twilight telling Data he needs to have fun. What about all those times he played poker? We don't need that. Instead, focus on Worf. We don't get an explanation for why Worf is away from DS9, just that he was at the Manzar colony. Instead of Data's malfunction being the inciting incident, Worf is. His time on DS9 means he's more familiar with the Dominion War than the crew of the Enterprise. We see hence the Enterprise has been putting out fires related to the war. Picard's relegated to being a friendly face welcoming new species into the Federation. Maybe the reason the Federation is so desperate to welcome them into their ranks is they need allies to help against the Dominion. Utilizing natural resources on a world uninvolved in this war isn't an isolated incident. This explains why the Enterprise hasn't been involved in the war. The Federation 
Federation has intel something's going down in the Briar Patch, and the Enterprise is the closest ship not busy doing something else. Pillar wanted to reference the passing of Worf's wife Jadzia, but Rick Berman said no, this would be confusing to people who didn't watch DS9. And he's probably right, as a child I would have been confused. But you don't want to act like it never happened either. My solution is to show through Worf's behavior he's a changed man. Don't mention Jadzia, but have Troy or Jordy comment on how different he is, and someone says, War can do that. It's not a blatant reference, but if you have watched DS9, you get it. This might be tricksy since some of the executives suggested doing embarrassing stuff with Worf. I'll give whichever clown suggested this the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't want to commit character assassination, but because Berman and Pillar's goal was to do something lighthearted, this might have been someone genuinely trying to help in that regard. It's still a bad idea when you can do so much more with this character. The broad strokes of the plot will remain. The Sona and the Baku are at odds with the Federation and the off-screen involvement of the Dominion coming into play here. There's more than 600 Baku, so the Sona won't have such an easy time wiping their enemies out. There's not an obvious mystery unfolding in the first act, but what appears to be a straightforward mission of stopping the Sona, allies with the Dominion, from invading the seemingly peaceful Baku. There's an abundance of dilithium on this world. The Federation doesn't want that falling into Dominion hands, and if they can get it for themselves, that would be pretty good. The Sona and the Baku aren't the same species, but we will keep the Sona as exiles from a century ago. Here, the tension between the Baku and the Federation won't stem from the Federation's use of technology, but the Baku seeing the Federation as not so different from the Dominion, large organizations using the resources of the little people in their war. There's a line in the movie where Ruafo tells Admiral Doherty the reason the Federation is facing so many large-scale attacks is because it's weak and dying. Maybe this is true and something that Picard should reflect on a little bit himself. Others have pointed out the Federation could have saved billions with the metaphasic radiation from the Baku world, but while the Baku's world may be in Federation space, their habitation on this world predates the existence of the Federation by about a hundred years, so they're hardly under Federation jurisdiction just because some people they've never met say so. Here, it's a little grayer. It would be great if the Federation could drive back the Sona, but how do they maintain that? To keep the Dilithium out of Dominion hands, they would have to keep an outpost here at least until the end of the war. And then what? What if new enemy species find out about this world? With how averse the Baku are to modern technology, they wouldn't have a chance of defending themselves. Even if the Federation doesn't take the Dilithium for themselves, Picard knows Dr. Octopus's wife is right. He and his crew are unwanted invaders, and there's no easy answers like in the movie. The Sona attack the main Baku settlement, which is built on the Dilithium mines. Our group splits up, Dr. Crusher heading the triage with the wounded. Some of the Baku reconsider their stance on modern tech when they see what she can accomplish, as many of their wounded would have lost their lives if it weren't for her. Our crew starts to notice changes in their physiology and maybe their behavior. Yes, we're doing Fountain of Youth and Dilithium. There can be more than one thing on a planet. If the crew is regressing mentally, we should see that affect their interactions and not just for humor. It was just a few years before this movie, but Riker's upset at how his transporter clone threw his career away by joining the Maquis, another morally gray conflict with no easy answers. Riker doesn't like his own lack of action when it came to the Maquis issues, so now he wants to act, a lot like he would have in his youth. Maybe Betazoids have trouble filtering out other people's emotions in their youth, so Troy will be more on edge. There's a thing where Betazoids accidentally project emotions onto those around them. If Troy's with Crusher's group, she might accidentally cause a panic among the Baku. While the movie thinks the Baku are this sweet, innocent, can-do-no-wrong community, their actions paint a different picture. As near as I can tell, the worst thing the Sona did was want to integrate technology into their lives, and for that, they were banished to a slow death. I'd want to explore that the Baku, while they're victims now, they aren't innocent. The Sona were minding their own business, but their more advanced ways were alluring to the younger Baku, and the Baku elders were tired of losing their own to the Sona during Baku Rum Springa. The Baku were the instigators and drove the Sona out. The Sona, while they had ships and some technology, they were severely outnumbered, and if they tried to resist, they would have died. Star Wars' grandfather is wary what his people are doing, and secretly comes to the crew under a white flag. He's not okay with Ruafo's plan to annihilate the Baku. He and many others thought they were coming back to rebuild their homes in exchange for the dilithium they would give to the Dominion, not to commit genocide. When the Enterprise crew finds out about this, it gives them pause, though they won't be ready to go rogue like in the movie. The Federation wasn't aware of the relationship between the Baku and the Sona, but it still muddies the waters for many of our characters. In DS9, the Parafes were exiled by the Prophets long ago for unspecified reasons, but the Parafes were responsible for Jadzia Dax's death, so Worf probably insists the Sona were exiled for a good reason. The parallels are there for anyone willing to look for them. Riker might remember the Maquis fighting for people wrongfully removed from their homes by the Federation, but despite misgivings, the Sona are still willingly allied with the Dominion, so they know they're still going to keep fighting, much as some might not like it. Even though Patrick Stewart wanted to turn Picard into Rambo, he's going to be the one to at least attempt to resolve this conflict diplomatically once he discovers the Baku's dirty little secret. He chews out the Baku leaders for essentially bringing this war on themselves. If they had tried to live peacefully with the Sona, the Dominion wouldn't be breathing down their necks now. Picard suggests the Baku reconsider 
consider their anti-tech ways if it can bring some level of peace to this corner of the galaxy. Some of the Baku are all for this. They've seen technology isn't as bad as they've always thought, though others are still very not okay with this. But the conflict isn't all over, because while some of the Sona are willing to let bygones be bygones, you've got those loyal to Ruafo who are still rightfully upset at what's happened to them, and no amount of diplomacy will fix this. This allows Picard to do what he does best, but it also satisfies Patrick Stewart's desire to do some action heroics. Pillar cited the Seven Samurai as a sort of influence on the story, and this would be where you get that, with some of the Sona allying with some of the Baku who are willing to defend their home from their wayward neighbors, along with our main characters. We're not going to have an arduous escape into the mountains, because then Ruafo's faction would have easy access to the Dilithium. We get a big whiz-bang action finale, Ruafo dies, not because the Enterprise thought it would be fun to blow him up instead of letting him stand trial, but because he's somehow hoisted by his own petard. And as I've already tried to hammer home, there won't be an easy resolution to the conflict. Even with Ruafo dead, a lot of the Baku still don't like the Sona or their more tech-savvy ways, but Picard strongly encourages they get over themselves because the Sona might just be their best hope of protection from outside threats. You'll see some kind of schism with some of the Baku willing to embrace their long-lost neighbors, while some of the others are still upset, but there's little they can do because they know Picard is right. If the Nausicans find out about this Fountain of Youth or the Dilithium, the Baku will need allies who don't want them dead. And that's it. Not all that different from the movie we got, at least in the broad strokes. Hopefully the complexity makes what was a pretty basic conflict feel a little more interesting. I know this was not even close to the kind of tone Pillar and Berman wanted, so realistically, I don't think this could have been done. But I do think it would have made a better movie. I hope you guys enjoyed this one, and if you did, I do this kind of thing all the time. So check out some of my other attempted fixes. And I'll do something else in the future, so be sure to check that out when the time comes. Until then, have a great rest of the day. Catch you later.